It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Andrew Sakura. Um, this is the invitation from our T32 program, Lung and Head and Neck Cancer Research. So Dr. Uh, Sakura started his um, bachelor degree in uh, at Yale University and then moved to New York um, to be MD, PhD uh, at Albert Einstein um, College of Medicine. And uh, I understand that um, during his PhD thesis, he studied a lot of TNF alpha signaling. So that's actually set the basis foundation for what he is doing uh, scientifically nowadays for immune microenvironment and tumor microenvironment. After he finished his MD-PhD and he stayed in New York and um, did his residency at the NYU for um, general surgery and uh, otolaryngology um, oncology surgery after that and went to MD Anderson for fellowship. And so he took his um, first faculty position back to New York for a short time uh, a month and night. And then uh, being Texan, get recruited back uh, to Baylor College of Medicine um, to lead the head and neck cancer research program. Uh, pretty much the same position that I have here. So um, look at the productivity and his research. It's amazing uh, in a way that it, it, I was at Baylor for a long time before Andrew arrived. So we know at that time there was not a single physician scientist at the ENT department. If I was not wrong, and Andy was the first physician scientist recruited in that department, right? And so from extramural dollar funding from zero to about $5 million um, within five years or four years, that's extremely impressive. So he's well-funded right now by um, NIH at the, uh, with the Moonshot um, Project U01 for studying immunology, immunotherapy and uh, tumor microenvironment, and funded by um, FDA for new clinical trial, and funded by uh, VA, um, for research, so um, not only the basic science is strong, but it's really have the real-time impact in clinical practice. And um, without, well, actually, the official um, job title um, he has right now is uh, Director of Head, Head and Neck Cancer Research at Baylor and uh, Vice Chair uh, of Research uh, in the ENT Department and Associate Professor with tenure. So without further ado, and he will tell us his benchtop research work. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Somewhere my mom is very happy right now, just, just knowing that happened. Um, and it's really been a pleasure uh, to spend some time here, uh, both um, you know, with members of the Head and Neck Cancer Program and with some of the students and postdocs. Um, it's been really very, very um, exciting for me to hear about the research here and how um, uh, some of it interacts with my own in ways that, that has really given me uh, um, uh, some, some you know, ideas that I think uh, we could build on in the future. So hopefully we'll be able to develop some collaborative projects out of this. Uh, but in the meantime, um, for the next uh, three hours, um, I will talk about uh, some of the research that we've already done 
And the one thing I need to do, yep, here it is, is find the mouse. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna focus on is some of the work that we've done primarily in preclinical models, so mouse models, um, trying to figure out how you can take tumors that do not respond to therapy, whether that be checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy or more conventional chemoradiotherapy, and make them responsive. Uh, so that is the topic of today's talk. Um, I just have the usual boring financial disclosures. Um, I also have a disclosure as a native-born Texan that we can secede at any time. It's actually in the state constitution, um, so that, that's like a real thing. Um, and today, what we're gonna talk about are basically three topics. Um, the first two, somewhat introductory. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, human papillomavirus, or HPV-related head and neck cancer, because that's a cancer type that's not um, necessarily familiar to, to everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the host immune interactions in HPV-related oropharynx cancer, or here abbreviated HPV-OPC, um, and many of those interactions, of course, occur all across different solid tumor types, so if head and neck cancer is not your favorite cancer, uh, don't worry, it's still relevant. Um, and then the meat of the talk will be um, our approaches we've taken to reversing the suppressive immune microenvironment that limits the efficacy of therapy. Um, so we'll start by talking about HPV-related head and neck cancer. So, um, you know, head and neck cancer is typically squamous, you know, we're typically talking about squamous cell carcinoma of the upper air digestive tract. So this is like cancer of the oral cavity or mouth, cancer of the throat, cancer of the uh, voice box, larynx, so on and so forth. So people always ask, oh, are you talking about brain cancer? Nope not brain cancer, um, or eyeball cancer. Nope, I don't know if that's a thing. I think it is a thing, but we don't study it. Uh, we study squamous cell carcinomas of the mucosa uh, of the upper air digestive tract. Um, worldwide, it's actually a really significant and important cancer. Here in the U.S., it's about the sixth or so most common cancer. Um, but some of the key clinical features of head and neck cancer are that um, if you take all comers, it has a pretty... Um, um, early stage disease is very treatable. More advanced disease, though, has you know almost a 50% overall mortality. Um, and uh, one of the really important things to understand about head and neck cancer is that it comes in two different flavors. So there's what we think about as sort of the the old fashioned traditional smoking associated head and neck cancer. Um, this looks like one of my patients at the VA hospital where I work smoking through his stoma um, after his voice box has been taken out. Um, um, this is tobacco-related. Um, alcohol is a contributing carcinogen, but it's primarily driven in this country by tobacco. Um, it has a broad mu mutational landscape. Um, it is uh, of declining incidence in the United States, and this is the bad, you know, you know what we think of as the bad prognosis, uh, head and neck cancer. On the other side here, and um, I don't know um, how, how well you can read from back there, that's a picture of Michael Douglas, who probably did more for head and neck cancer public awareness than like anybody else uh, by getting HPV-related head and neck cancer, uh, which was uh, thoughtful of him. Um, that is independent of smoking, although as I'm going to mention in a minute, you know, they can still smoke, and that has implications. Um, it has fewer somatic mutations. It has a more favorable prognosis. And the really important thing about HPV-related head and neck cancers is that they've really exploded over the past couple decades. They are far and away uh, the most common, or, or sorry, the most rapidly rising um, head and neck cancer type we see. And we're actually just at the cusp of head and neck, um, uh, HPV-related head and neck cancers actually overtaking cervical cancer cancer in this country as, you know, in, ter in terms of incidence. So uh, this is something that as the tobacco-related cancers have sort of started declining um, has uh, kind of caught us by surprise. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, one of the, the key things about HPV-related, are you able to see that? Yeah, okay. Uh, one of the key things about HPV-related head and neck cancers is that they have a much better survival. Um, this has been shown in basically every study that's ever um, uh, been done, <clears throat> that the HPV-related cancers have a much better survival than HPV-negative uh, cancers. 
Um, and the, the, the wrinkle to that, the thing that makes that, um, you know, sort of more uh, complicated is that some of these patients can actually smoke. So on the one hand, um, you know, we like to say the biggest advance in head and neck cancer survival in the past 50 years is actually an, an epidemic. It's a viral, it's an epidemic of viral cancers. That's been like the best news because that actually um, is the stuff that has had uh, traditionally good survival. On the other hand, we're beginning to realize um, a, a little bit later than we should have that these patients can also smoke. And though the typical HPV-related cancer patient has much less tobacco history than your typical HPV-unrelated um, uh, 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 cancer patient. There are populations, um, for example, my population I treat, so I'm a surgeon at our VA hospital, and I treat veterans who have smoked like 100 pack years, and they have both flavors at the same time. They have HPV-related head and neck cancers with 100 pack years of tobacco superimposed on that, and that has a far worse prognosis, and we're just sort of realizing that that is a different entity. It's not going to be the focus of my talk today, but it is the fo one of the focuses of research that we do, um, particularly um, uh, Vlad Sandalache, one of, one of the junior faculty members who works with me. Um, so current treatment approaches we have for head and neck cancers are uh, surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy. Patients with advanced disease may get all three of those. They may actually get combination surgery. That includes all of the above. Um, targeted therapy in the form of EGFR, um, targeted therapy. Um, um, has been around for a while, and of course the most exciting thing that has happened in recent memory is the introduction of immunotherapy, particularly um, the introduction of checkpoint blockade uh, targeting the PD-1 axis. Um, and that is continuing, the uh, role of immunotherapy in head and neck cancer is continuing to evolve. Um, the, the indications are expanding, it's getting moved um, more up towards the front of treatment, and um, I anticipate that those trends are going to continue. Um, and when we think about the therapeutic space um, in head and neck cancer, so as we're developing head and neck cancer therapeutics, what are we trying to do? I used to think of it this way, where for, you know, you kind of divide cancers into different buckets. So, you know, here you have your HPV positive and HPV negative disease. Here you have primary untreated disease, so basically new cancers that have never been treated. Here you have recurrent metastatic disease. Any patient with recurrent metastatic disease of any flavor has a bad, bad cancer. And our goal is to try to develop therapeutics that can extend their survival and, you know, maybe cure them, but at least, you know, get them more time. Patients with HPV-negative disease, which has a really poor prognosis, particularly at later stages, we're trying to develop therapeutics that target minimal residual disease that may be left over after conventional therapy and decrease that over 50% rate of disease recurrence after we treat them. Patients with HPV-positive disease, there is still a role for treatment, even though they respond very well to chemoradiotherapy or um, surgical uh, therapy. Um, there's still a role in terms of improving the quality of life and doing what we call treatment de-intensification, bringing the level of treatment down to a more tolerable level so patients don't have such severe side effects uh, that can affect their swallowing, their voice, so on and so forth. However, uh, the realization that so many of our HPV-positive patients smoke has kind of thrown a monkey wrench into this way of thinking about things, and I'm increasingly thinking that we really have to think about this category of bad actors here as not so much defined by HPV status, but actually defined by tobacco use status. So again, not, not, not the topic of... Um, uh, my talk today, but the point being that sometimes people ask, well, why are you studying HPV-related cancers if they respond so well to chemoradiotherapy? And the answer is, number one, we can learn a lot from it, and number two, they don't all actually respond that well, particularly in the context of smoking. So we're going to move on and talk about host immune interactions in solid tumors, including HPV-related oropharynx cancer. Um, Obviously, when we talk about immunotherapy, we are talking about trying to activate the cells in your body uh, that uh, drive the immune response and trying to deactivate the cells that suppress the immune response or some combination of the two. Um, and something that I like to point out 
is that, you know, what we're asking your immune system to do is really hand-to-hand -hand combat, like cell-to-cell -cell combat between the cells of your immune system and the tumor. And if you think about that, that seems kind of crazy that every single tumor cell has to be identified, located, and, you know, assassinated by uh, uh, an immunocyte. So here, just to sort of make that point, these are some cells that we had growing in the lab. Um, these are some oral cancer, uh, oral cancer cell line that was growing in the lab. Uh, my colleague uh, Simon Young had some T cells that had been educated to respond to oral cancer. He threw them in and our colleague Rita Serta, who's a really gifted electron microscopist, took this picture that wound up like winning all these awards um, at the NCI. Um, and actually, this picture is like a hundred times more famous than I am or ever will be. Like this picture is everywhere. So um, my 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 thirteen year old daughter explained to me that I created a meme. And she was so excited. Like, like my whole life, I've been like, you know, like doing surgery on people with cancer and like, you know, trying to develop new cancer therapies. And she's like, whatever. And then she realized I created a meme. And all of a sudden, like, I was cool for like 15 minutes. Um, so it's kind of crazy to think that you can actually train your immune system to do this. But, you know, the, the, the thing that makes that possible, and, you know, whenever we think about things that are really big, you know, we think about astronomy, right? We think about the universe and galaxies. Well, there are more immune cells in your body than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Think about that. And if you could just get a little fraction of those cells excited about something, you would have this incredibly powerful treatment. And that is exactly what we are here to do. Um, some of the advantages of immunotherapy um, in relation to other therapies. So one is that, um, you know, of course, we're trying to increase the efficacy. We're trying to increase the durability of therapies, uh, or sorry, of therapeutic response. And sorry, it's a Mac to PC formatting glitch, uh, which I couldn't fix before the talk started. Um, but the point here, these are survival curves. So these are the survival of patients treated with immunotherapy or treated with, say, targeted therapies, chemotherapy. And just to sort of like, you know, paint with a very broad brush, you know, other therapies that rely on killing tumor cells tend to be really effective right off the bat. So, you know, there's, there's you know, almost every patient we treat with radiation, chemotherapy, or the combination of the two, their tumors shrink. I mean, I mean, it's not like they don't shrink. They shrink, and generally they disappear. But the problem is eventually they become, res the, the, the resistant cells eventually outgrow, and they come back. When you talk about immunotherapy, a much smaller number of patients actually get an upfront response. A much number, a smaller number of patients actually get that dramatic tumor shrinkage up front. However, those who do respond tend to have something which we call a tail to the survival curve, which is that those responses tend to be really, really long lasting to the point where, you know, there are patients who have, you know, decade or decades long remissions or even cures. And that's something that is much rarer with other treatment approaches. And that's one of the things that makes immunotherapy excitement exciting. Um, the second thing in terms of trying to like create a toolkit of things that you can treat patients with is that all therapies that work have toxicities, but the toxicities of immunotherapy tend to be immune mediated. They don't really overlap with the toxicities of radiation and chemotherapy, allowing for um, this concept of combining them in ways where you can get a lot of therapy into the patients and the patients can still tolerate it. So, so those are some of the reasons why we're so excited about immunotherapy. So as we move into um, the era of immunotherapy for head and neck cancer, I'm going to sort of summarize, you know, a lot of clinical data by saying that um, currently the only clinically approved immunotherapy for head and neck cancers is uh, checkpoint inhibition. Um, and this is primarily with, um, you know, targeting the PD-1, PD-L1 axis. Um, and although we're really excited about um, the fact that there are patients who haven't really responded to anything that do respond to immunotherapy and head and neck cancer, at the end of the day, about 15% of our patients get some sort of meaningful benefit from treatment. So 15% is better than zero, and 15% in a heavily treated population that traditionally hasn't responded to much, you know, is, is still exciting. But what this means is that we have these new, extremely expensive drugs and we're treating patients with them, and the majority of patients don't benefit from the drugs, which means that if we can develop strategies that will increase the fraction of patients that uh, benefit from therapy, 
we're going to be able to take these drugs and make them clinically much, much more efficacious. And that's sort of the goal um, of my research uh, program. So, you know, the, the way I describe it to you is that, you know, you wouldn't think immunotherapy would be like stand-up comedy, right? You'd think they'd be very different, and in fact they are. Uh, stand-up comedy probably, like, pays a lot better. But um, it, they're similar in the sense that it's all about the audience that you are targeting. And that if you throw your best material into a hostile crowd, nothing's funny. Sort of similarly, if the tumor immune microenvironment is not primed to respond to a therapy, you can have the most amazing new drugs in the world and nothing is going to happen. So a lot of what we think about is how do we sort of warm up the audience, if you, know, if you will, and uh, create a scenario where the microenvironment is going to be responsive. And this brings us to this concept of hot versus cold tumors that most of you have probably heard about at some point. And the idea here is that there are tumors that are immunologically hot, and there's a lot going on inside of them, and they just naturally are infiltrated with T cells, they're infiltrated with suppressor cells, they're infiltrated just with all sorts of cells, but the point is there's an immune response in there that can be stimulated, and those are the tumors that tend to respond best to immunotherapy, as opposed to what we call a cold tumor where you look inside and there's just not a lot of immune cells. You know, there's, there's just a not, not a lot going on. It's very hard to get those to respond. And if you look first at the response to um, checkpoint in, uh, inhibitors um, in head and neck, lung cancer, melanoma, other cancers, um, depending, you know, there, there's many different ways you can look at that immune microenvironment. You can look at gene signatures. You can look at immune infiltrate, uh, uh, sorry, immune infiltrate. Um, but by whatever means you look at it, the response to these agents tends to be correlated with whether you have a hot tumor, a responsive tumor, or a cold tumor that doesn't respond. And interestingly, even if you move away from um, um, anti-PD-1 therapy um, and just look at things like response to chemo radiation, uh, we see in melanoma, head and neck cancer, other tumors, that um, this cold, hot dichotomy still persists. And that actually makes sense because these um, conventional, you know, what we think of as conventional therapies actually have a lot of immune basis to their mechanism of action. And so I asked my colleague Mitch Frederick, who's a molecular biologist who works with me at Baylor, to go into the Cancer Genome Atlas, or T CGA, which is a large molecular compilation of sequencing um, and RNA sequencing results from all sorts of cancer patients. And he drilled down into the HPV positive head and neck cancer patients, um, used an informatics pipeline to look at their um, immune profiles. And what we find is that even though we tend to think um, of these HPV virally induced cancers as the hotter type of cancer in head and neck cancer, you know, really it's a minority of these tumors that are truly hot. In this, in this graph, red is hot and blue is colder. And the vast, you know, I would say almost two-thirds of the tumors are, you know, sort of cold to warm. So you have a lot of room to try to make these um, tumors, you know, hot tumors that'll respond better. And this has been shown in lots and lots of different studies. So... How do we do this? And, you know, one of the first strategies that people thought about um, is do we have stuff off the shelf like chemoradiotherapy that can activate the tumor immune microenvironment? Um, and, you know, vice versa, will a more active tumor immune microenvironment make these therapies more effective? And if you look, if you take chemoradiotherapy, which is probably the most common treatment for advanced stage head and neck cancer, um, it's kind of a, a mixed bag in the sense that chemoradiotherapy actually can activate the tumor immune microenvironment uh, through a variety of mechanisms, certainly by killing cells, releasing antigens, activating danger-associated molecular patterns, and so on and so forth. But we and others have shown that radiotherapy and chemoradiotherapy can also suppress the, um, the immune system and can suppress uh, the response in the tumor uh, through killing of lymphocytes and other mechanisms. Um, chemo, and, and this is an important question because, you know, it's not just my mice that are being treated with the combination of radiotherapy or chemoradiotherapy and immune agents. There's something right now like 57 clinical trials, I think this is from about a year ago, but probably the numbers are similar or greater, like 57 clinical trials that combine CTLA-4-directed checkpoint inhibition with radiotherapy, and then over, you know, almost 200 trials combining PD-1 with radiotherapy. So this is something 
something that is, you know, happening now in uh, clinical trials, and we really need to understand what's happening uh, at a really granular level. And um, as I mentioned, you know, the uh, potential effects of radiotherapy or chemoradiotherapy on a tumor can really be suppressive, stimulatory, or both at the same time. So we actually showed a few years back that um, patients uh, with HPV-related oropharynx cancer who were being treated with conventional chemoradiotherapy um, actually become really immunosuppressed if you look at their peripheral immune response. So they lose uh, their CDA-positive lymphocytes, PD-1 gets upregulated, um, and patients who had pre-existing, we actually measured the pre-existing HPV-related T-cell responses in their blood before and after therapy, and patients who actually had T-cell responses to HPV before chemoradiation lost them almost immediately um, after treatment was done. So chemoradiotherapy can be profoundly immune suppressive. However, um, it's also been shown, and in, in here um, uh, my colleagues uh, Case Malief and uh, Serge Vanderwater showed in cervical cancer that um, conventional therapies can also be very immune stimulatory. So what they um, showed in a vaccine trial where uh, they were testing a long peptide vaccine against uh, HPV as a therapeutic cancer vaccine that the patients who actually responded and responded well were the ones who had recently undergone chemotherapy, which seemed sort of counterintuitive, but when they kind of drilled down, got into mouse models, tried to understand this, they found that the combination of um, uh, carboplatin and taxol actually depletes immunosuppressive myeloid cells, and if you time it just right, then the vaccine can be more effective. Um, so we really need to understand better what is happening at a very granular level inside particular tumors under particular treatment sets to understand what is happening to the immune system and how we can develop combination therapy approaches that are going to work. And to my mind, some of the key translational research questions we want to ask are, number one, can we increase the therapeutic efficacy of checkpoint inhibitors and other immunotherapies by inducing this cold to hot transition to a more responsive tumor microenvironment? Can we increase the efficacy of conventional therapies, therapies we already have, uh, like chemoradiation, by modulating the tumor microenvironment? And then how do we put these together? How do we actually integrate immunotherapy and um, standard of care therapies like chemoradiotherapy? Um, my daughter has explained to me that this is an emoji, and this is the appropriate way to communicate with her by texting <laughs> and other methods. So, so how are we going to answer these questions? And, you know, if, if you talk to people who are in pharma, and I'm, I'm going to once again paint with kind of a broad brush, but, you know, the answer is always, let's do some clinical trials, you know, and this is a topic of conversation I had with both the students and some of the faculty today. Um, you all brought it up. And, you know, the question is, how many questions can we answer with clinical trials? So we can answer a lot of questions, but there was this article in the cancer letter from a couple years back that tabulated all the different trials in PD, you know, basically in the PD-1 inhibitor space in cancer at that time, and there were actually more patient slots for PD-1 inhibitor trials than there are cancer patients. So it just doesn't make sense. Like, like you just can't do um, all the clinical trials necessary to test all the possible immune combinations, and as we keep inventing more immune drugs, you know, that becomes a bigger problem. Um, the New York Times had sort of a similar article a year later, um, too many drug trials, too few patients. Um, here they have at Memorial Sloan Kettering, apparently my medical oncology doppelganger. Anyway, good. It's a nice looking guy doing the right thing for his patients. Um, but the point is that we can, you know, as exciting as clinical trials are, we cannot stop doing preclinical research in mouse models. And I was excited to hear, from, you know, about all the different groups here that are, in fact, doing that type of work. So we're now going to talk, you know, the meat of the talk about how um, we're trying to model the suppressive immune microenvironment of HPV-related oropharynx cancer um, in mouse models and get some insights there. And the hypothesis is that we can enhance the clinical or anti-tumor efficacy of both immunotherapy and uh, chemoradiation by doing this activation of the tumors uh, so they transition from cold to hot, and then reversing uh, treatment-induced immune-suppressive factors that we know that treatments um, induce in the patients and in our mouse models.
So to do this, we have to, we, we need a model, and we use a number of different models, but when we're talking about HPV-related head and neck cancer, uh, one of our go-to models was developed by my colleagues um, Chad Spanos and John Lee uh, when they were at Sanford Health, and it's the MEER, the MIR model. Um, this is a syngenaic um, HPV-related oropharynx cancer uh, model. Um, so it's on a black six background, which is nice because you have a lot of reagents available to you on that background. And what they did is they took pharyng you know, pharyngeal cells from uh, black six mice and they transformed them with the two um, oncoproteins, E6 and E7 from HPV, um, as well as the RAS oncogene. And when you transform cells with all three of these proteins, you get a tumor line that grows like a cancer in mice. Um, and there are some really nice characteristics about this tumor line if you're doing immunological research. Uh, one is that the HPV oncogenes are not just antigenic passengers, uh, they're actually driving the tumor biology. So unlike you know, having a tumor with ovalbumin or something like that where you can um, assess the uh, specific immune response, you can do that here too, but these are driver genes, like these are actually driving the biology of the tumor. They can't be lost. Um, you can uh, also target these genes, these viral, foreign viral genes with immunotherapy um, directed against E6 and E7, uh, such as anti-tumor vaccination, just as you know, we're testing in people. And the, um, uh, Chad uh, Spanos showed nicely that the effects of chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy depend on having an intact host immune response in the mouse. So these things become much less effective um, in an immunodeficient mouse. Um, this uh, model in the flank, at least, is highly resistant to checkpoint inhibition, so it's a model of immune refractory HPV-related head and neck cancer, which exists. Um, so we took, we took this model, and we, you know, because our interest is in translational science and trying to develop concepts that, you know, can translate into the clinic, we applied uh, what I think of as a clinically realistic chemoradiotherapy model um, to, to this tumor model. And when I say clinically realistic is um, rather than taking the mice and treating them with, um, you know, say a couple huge doses of immunotherapy, um, we tried to first start out by treating them with something that's similar to how we treat our patients, and that's weekly cisplatin. So they get cisplatin, in this case, intraperitoneally once a week, um, and they get fractionated radiation. So for those of you who aren't clinician, that means you take your total dose of radiation and you break it up into chunks. And so um, five days a week, you know, they'll get 10 gray, or, or sorry, they'll get three gray of radiation a total of 10 times. So they get 30 gray, but they get it fractionated over the course of two weeks. Uh, again, more similar to how we treat patients. We treat patients in that fractionated manner. And when we do this, I'll show you the, um, you know, tumor's growth is slowed, uh, but the combination of chemotherapy and radiation in this model doesn't cure the tumors. So that gives us lots of room to try to test things that are going to make that treatment better. Um, and then we've also shown that um, doing this induces immune dysfunction in ways that are similar to what we showed happens in our HPV-related oropharynx cancer patients that are treated with chemoradiotherapy in terms of elevating um, MDSC, decreasing CDA-positive T cells, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the way we radiate them is with a rad source of radiator. The mouse goes in a lead shield. We're using the, this tumor as a flank rather than an orthotopic model. Um, and we're using the lead shield to direct the radiation to the tumor. And as I said, this is the schedule of radiation and chemotherapy that they get over the course of two weeks. And so what we found is that, you know, we get pretty modest clinical benefit from this. So if you look at the effect on tumor growth, you can see that um, either cisplatin radiation or the combination slows but does not um, cause tumor regression. So, so we're not curing mice. Um, and it extends tumor survival, but again, we're not curing mice. You know, the, the mice still ultimately succumb to their tumor. So that gives us some headroom. Um, we also looked, using nanostring, looking at immune gene uh, expression, we were able to find that conventional chemoradiotherapy uh, does not activate the tumor immune microenvironment as we kind of expected it to. Uh, it, it actually suppressed um, um, the immune response in the tumor. Um, and this was pretty global. Uh, this was, um, you know, adaptive pathways, um, innate immune pathways, so on and so forth. Basically, the tumors get pretty cold, and, and if you look inside them, uh, which 
which I'll show you later, and look for immunocytes, we see the same thing. Um, they get pretty cold after chemoradiation. So instead of activating the time, chemoradiation in this model is suppressing the tumor immune microenvironment, um, also known as the time. Um, and so what we um, you know, have here is what I would call like the first pillar upon which we're going to build an effective combination therapy strategy. So here we have chemoradiotherapy. Um, it has anti-tumor effect, but it's not perfect, and um, it has some adverse effects that we would like to reverse in terms of what it does to uh, the immune microenvironment. So that moves us to the immune microenvironment and trying to modulate it. And my lab has, for you know, about the past 10 years, uh, targeted a molecule called inducible nitric oxide synthase, or INOS, as a strategy for activating the immune microenvironment. So um, INOS is one of a family of nitric oxide synthases. Um, they're expressed you know, widely throughout the body. Um, they, uh, they come in different flavors. There's neuronal, endothelial, and then inducible, or INOS. Um, and that is the one that is most highly expressed in immune cells as well as cancer cells. Um, it's overexpressed in most solid tumors, so you can, you can find uh, almost everywhere people look in solid tumors that INOS is in fact overexpressed. And it's sort of a global regulator both of cell intrinsic oncogenic properties of the tumor, uh, but also um, uh, of uh, tumor induced immunosuppression. And uh, we wrote a, a review a few years back that, you know, tried to summarize this. And you could see here that, you know, um, there are many, many different ways in which the expression of INOS drives cancer growth, both directly by activating uh, these signaling pathways, but then indirectly also by um, repolarizing the immune system or shutting it down. So it is a bad actor in cancer. And we've shown, I'm not, I'm going to, um, um, you know, just cite our published literature today um, rather than show data. Um, but over the course of this 10 years, we've shown that INOS is sort of an, an almost like an overlooked uh, powerful regulator of tumor-induced immune responses. Um, um, it drives MDSC recruitment and activation, and if you block it, you can block those things. Um, it enhances uh, macrophage polarization towards a uh, pro-tumor M2 phenotype. Again, you can block that if you block INOS. Um, and most interestingly, uh, we found that um, Paradoxically, nitric oxide actually blocks the differentiation of CD4 positive T cells into T regs, which means that for all the good stuff that happens when you block INOS, for example, with a small molecule inhibitor, there's one bad thing that happens, which is you induce more T regs. And um, we've shown that you can enhance the ability of INOS inhibition to activate the immune response by administering it with a T reg depleting agent, for example, low dose cyclophosphamide. And I'll show you that in a little bit. Uh, many other groups have, have, of course, studied INOS and uh, tumor immunology and, you know, found similar results. Um, and there's even clinical trials um, ongoing that are looking at the effect of INOS inhibitors in head and neck cancer. So what we wanted to do was sort of leverage all this existing information about INOS inhibition and develop sort of a cocktail that would highly activate the time. And we arrived at this cocktail that um, combines low-dose cyclophosphamide, which is good at depleting regulatory T cells. It also uh, non-specifically activates effector cells as well. Um, and it's something that's um, included in numerous other, uh, in numerous clinical trials as kind of a, a, a non-specific immune activator. Um, and then we deplete, or sorry, we inactivate INOS with a small molecule called L-NIL. Um, it's a competitive antagonist of INOS. It looks a lot like the substrate for INOS, which is arginine. Um, it's actually been in clinical trials for asthma and inflammatory disease before, so it's something that could go into people. And we use this to deplete the myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And we've shown in melanoma models that the combination of cyclophosphamide plus L-NIL really potently activates the immune microenvironment by suppressing Treg and MDSC and increasing CD8-positive T cell infiltration. So now we want to apply this to head and neck cancer in our head and neck model. So the first thing we showed, and you can see here, this is our um, uh, cartoon of uh, how we treat the mice um, before we uh, get the tumors. We showed again by uh, nanostring analysis that the combination of cyclophosphamide and L-NIL uh, takes those cold tumors. So here's our control tumors. Here's what happens after chemoradiotherapy. They get cold. 
But when we treat with cyclophosphamide nil-nil, we uh, are basically able to wake these tumors up again. So we're able to uh, stimulate um, the immune response inside the tumors, both at the level of, of uh, gene pathways, um, including many interesting ones here, um, as well as um, using uh, computational tools to look at the profiles of immune cells, such as uh, CDA-positive T cells, dendritic cells, so on and so forth. So we show activation of innate and adaptive immune responses at the level of gene expression uh, when we treat these chemoradiated tumors with the combination of cyclophosphamide and L-nil. Um, and let's see, do I have, yeah, I want to I wanna highlight, actually I'm going to highlight three people um, in this talk. Uh, the first one is Aurelie Hanato, um, a recent postdoc in my lab, and um, whether labeled or not, the next, you know, ten slides or so are from the paper that she recently published in the Journal of Immunotherapy for Cancer. Um, so when we actually look inside the tumor, and by flow cytometry, we look at the immune infiltration in these tumors, what we find is that the... Um, balance of effector, you know, particularly CDA-positive T cells to uh, regulatory T cells, uh, when we look at the lymphoid um, uh, microenvironment, um, is very favorably modulated by the combination of cyclophosphamide and L-nil. So here you could see um, TISNI plots. Uh, those of you who do a lot of flow cytometry have probably seen this before, but this is a way of taking uh, really complicated high-dimensional data and then kind of like smashing it down to two dimensions. And so you get these things that look like brain MRIs, but what this actually is is every little island here is a different population of immune cells. And you get pretty specific, like this island over here is our CDA-positive T cells, and then this little subset here is actually the CDA-positive T cells that, by tetramer, respond to the HPV protein E7. Um, and so what we find is that, you know, focusing on the island of CDA-positive T cells, you could see they become depleted with chemoradiotherapy, that CTX and L-nil, um, or sorry, cyclophosphamide and L-nil stimulates um, the CDA-positive T cells, and that in combination with chemoradiotherapy, cyclophosphamide and L-nil both increases the CDA-positive T cell population, but also particularly those tumor-reactive E7 um, uh, tetramer-positive T cells. And you can see down here that when we look at markers of CDA T cell activation, like perforin and um, uh, uh, I don't show it here, but uh, Granzyme as well, you can see increases um, in their activation level. Um, and then Orly uh, developed a uh, assay where she was able to take the CD8 positive T cells uh, from mice um, as well and co-culture them with uh, tumor-derived um, myeloid cells. And basically she created a co-culture assay where she could ask the question, you know, are, you know how, how able are the antigen-presenting cells from the tumor able to stimulate the CD8-positive T cells to become active and become cytolytic. Um, and what she found is that then when you move these cells into uh, tumor co-culture, uh, that the ability to kill uh, was highest in uh, when we took t uh, sorry when we took myeloid cells from the mice that had been treated with the combination of chemoradiotherapy and cyclophosphamide and l nil so something was happening in the myeloid compartment that was actually educating these c d a positive T cells to become more cytolytic and when we put these two things together, we found that activation of the immune microenvironment took something that wasn't particularly effective, chemoradiotherapy, and made it much more effective. So we were able to unmask the efficacy of chemoradiotherapy in this tumor model. And you could see here that um, when we look um, at tumor growth, and here every line is the growth of an individual uh, mouse's tumor, you know, contr in control mice, the tumors grow rapidly um, and kill the mice. Chemoradiotherapy slows things down a little bit, but eventually all mice succumb. Immune modulation alone isn't really enough um, to uh, develop a productive anti-tumor response, but the combination of chemoradiotherapy and microenvironment modulation actually takes established tumors and causes them to regress, and in many cases, um, completely regress and stay regressed for over 100 days. So you could see here that we're now actually able to cure a pretty significant fraction of mice by the combination of microenvironment modulation and chemoradiotherapy. <laughs> 
So the second pillar of our effective combination therapy is the modulation of the tumor immune microenvironment. And what we're able to do here is reverse the unfavorable effector suppressor ratios that are induced by chemoradiation, reshape the myeloid um, tumor immune microenvironment, which I didn't show here, but um, it's in our paper, and then induce the infiltration of highly active anti-tumor CD8 positive T cells. However, um, as you can see here, um, you know, we're curing some mice, but we don't yet have a therapy that's effective in the ma majority of mice. And what we wanted to do was develop an, uh, in a combination therapy that, number one, could clear, you know, large established tumors. Number two, could mimic what's happening in clinical trials in some of our patients right now, where we're trying to substitute anti-PD-1 checkpoint inhibition for chemotherapy. So we're keeping the radiation. We're getting rid of chemotherapy, no more chemotherapy. Uh, we're substituting um, anti-PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and we're going to ask if the combination of that, which is, you know, as I mentioned to you before, PD-1 plus radiotherapy, which is going on in clinical trials in head and neck cancer and other tumors right now, can we make that more effective by modulating the immune microenvironment? And this isn't just, you know, doing it because everybody's doing everything with PD-1 plus, you know, whatever they want, but we actually saw in our mouse model that, number one, PD-1 is upregulated on CD8 positive T cells by chemoradiotherapy, and that, number two, when we treat mice with the immune microenvironment stimulating regimen of cyclophosphamide and um, the INOS inhibitor L-NIL, that PD-1 and PD-L1 are two of the most highly upregulated genes, probably because we're activating the teams the T cells. It makes sense. Uh, but it gives a real rationale for combining these different approaches. Uh, so a question we always get is, does the tumor model express PD-1 and PD-L1? And the answer is yes. So this MIR model does express um, PD-L1 and tumor infiltrating CD8 cells express PD-1. So that's not a limitation. However, when you look at checkpoint inhibition with either PD-1 or CTLA-4 targeting monotherapy, this tumor, when injected in the flank, is really not particularly responsive to checkpoint inhibitors. So you can see here we're using a fairly standard regimen of six doses, you know, over the course of approximately two weeks. <coughs> and uh, what you can see is that PD-1 or CTLA-4 checkpoint inhibitors by themselves do almost nothing. The combination you know, does a little, but you have to go through a lot of mice to see much of a response. And when we combine that with radiation, now we have something that is at least a little bit more effective, but we're still not able to cure uh, tumors. We're not able to clear to uh, establish tumors. So this is a relatively checkpoint resistant uh, model, even with radiation on board. So the question is, by modulating the tumor immune microenvironment, can we make that better? And so to do this, um, I'm going to move to uh, my, my uh, work that's been done by my uh, graduate student, Jared Newton, um, who basically took Orly's results and tried to take it to you know, the next level by creating what he calls CPR therapy. And CPR stands for cyclophosphamide L-nil, checkpoints, and radiation. Um, I tried to talk him out of calling it CPR therapy, but I was not successful, so that's what we call it. Um, and this work actually was recently published in the Journal of Immunotherapy for Cancer, so I have to go back and update this. Uh, but but this, this is a published paper that you can go back um, and review. Uh, but I'll review it here for you so you don't have to read the paper. So what we found is that substituting um, uh, uh, PD-1 and CTLA-4, and, and the, the combination is, I'm not going to show here, but the combination um, is better than either alone, um, doesn't add toxicity, um, and uh, the efficacy is as good or better uh, than uh, what we showed with chemoradiotherapy. So you can see here that uh, the combination therapy is uh, capable of causing regression and clearance of uh, fairly large established tumors. Um, and extending the survival in a, um, you know, significant fraction of mice. You know, about a third of the mice, you know, get durable long-term cure. And so we were pretty happy with that. I mean, it's nice to take away chemotherapy because chemotherapy has significant side effects, uh, but we still wanted something that would be more effective. So we looked into how the radiation was delivered. And so, you know, I told you we were delivering radiation basically the way we deliver it to our patients, which is little doses of radiation in multiple fractions. However, 
there is another way to deliver radiation um, that's used in uh, regimens such as um, SBRT, gamma knife, you know, things where you take a lot of radiation and you deliver it in one or two or three, you know, really, really big fractions. Um, and immunologically, that can actually work very differently from fractionated radiation. That may actually immunologically be more stimulatory. So um, we went and we um, compared the ability of our standard sort of patient-like fractionation regimen to um, this um, alternative fractionation where uh, the mice got two, you know, they still got um, um, either cisplatin or checkpoint inhibitor, um, but they got two big doses of radiation. Um, and we're able to show, to make a long story short, that some of the negative effects of fractionated radiation in terms of suppressing CD8 positive T cells, particularly the ratio of CD8 positive T cells uh, to Tregs and um, uh, MDSC are actually um, reversed when we fractionate the radiation in an alternative fashion. Um, we also found that we had to go down on the total dose of radiation. So uh, we had been giving 30 gray of radiation, um, but 2 times 15 gray was pretty toxic to the mice. They actually got a lot of skin dermatitis, which um, you know, was a problem and hard to treat. So if we went down to 2 times 10 gray, we were actually able to uh, basically spare the mice dermatitis, uh, but still um, had something that was pretty effective. So this new CPR regimen with this, um, you know, alternative fractionation actually turns out to work a lot better. Um, so to make a long story short, you could see that, again, we get regression of established tumors, but in this case, the regression is really durable for the vast majority of our tumors. So we're able to clear these large tumors in about 70% of mice when we give the full CPR regimen with alternative fractionation. And we're able to show that this is correlated with extremely um, powerful changes in the tumor microenvironment. So we have um, here, we're looking at um, by uh, multiplex um, immunohistochemistry um, done by my colleague Yvonne Sanger at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. You're able to see here that, um, hang on a second. Yeah, here we go. So we're able to see that the uh, combination of um, you know the CPR combination with you know the checkpoint inhibitor radiation and microenvironment modulation you know basically floods the tumor with um, CD8 positive T cells um, much more so than any of the individual treatment components alone and that this um, this is really a durable and sort of like a kinetic response so we're able to show that both the total number of CD8 positive T cells and the ratio of CD8 positive T cells to regulatory T cells continues to improve even after we've stopped treating the mice. So it unleashes these very durable and long-lasting immune responses. Um, and these are active, you know, um, CD8 positive T cells. So when we look um, at the um, expression of uh, KI67, which is one marker of activated um, CD8 positive T cells, we see that that's um, improved in the combination therapy group. Um, and we know that these CDA positive T cells are critical to the result uh, because when we deplete them with an antibody, you can see here our ability to use an antibody um, to deplete CDA positive T cells pretty much completely. This is associated with an almost total uh, loss of the ability to cure um, and uh, maintain clearance of the treated mice. So CDA positive T cells are critically important, which is not a surprise, I'll be honest, uh, but um, this way we're able to know that that's how the treatment works. And most interestingly, we're actually able to induce in a memory response, which is antigen specific. So um, you can see here that when we re-challenge mice that were originally cured of their tumor, so you can imagine you have mice with large tumors, we treat them with CPR, um, the mice are cured, we let them go 100 days, and then we re-challenge them with a five or a tenfold uh, greater number of tumors than we used the first time. And you could see here that the majority of uh, mice do, you know, do not grow tumors out. So they're protected from re-challenge as opposed to age match controls, you know, where the tumors grow just fine. 
Um, and uh, we were able to show in a very interesting way that this is, in fact, antigen-specific. And we were able to do this by using another cell line, a cell line called uh, Mach 2, which is an HPV-negative syngenaic cell line that my colleague Simon Young actually put E6 and E7 oncogenes into. So the only shared thing between the MIR model that we're using for the original uh, challenge and Mach 2 is in the case of Mach 2 E6 and E7, they share the E6 and E7 antigens. And we're able to show that those mice, um, the mice that are cured of the HPV positive MIR tumor, are protected from re challenge from Mach 2 bearing E6 and E7 antigens, but not the parental strain. So we have antigen dependent. Um, memory of the sort that you would like to induce in your patients to induce long-term uh, immunologic control of their risk of uh, recurrence after treatment. Um, and then finally, and I'm going to wrap things up here, um, you know, the question that we get all the time is, how can you give mice that much treatment? Can they tolerate it? And it is a lot of treatment. Um, I'll point out that, you know, as we continue to de develop immunotherapy clinical trials, those trials are beginning to pile on treatments as well. Uh, but to make a long story short, uh, the treatment is um, uh, hard on the mice, so they lose something close to 10%, but not quite 10% of their body weight during treatment. However, they regain it um, more or less completely uh, when treatment stops, um, and um, we don't see any overt uh, side effects beyond depigmentation um, uh, in the area where the tumor is, which is interestingly something that we used to see all the time in melanoma studies uh, when an immunotherapy was really working well um, in our mouse models. Uh, we do see that depigmentation, but otherwise the mice seem to be pretty able to tolerate treatment. So in summary, um, you know, we've shown that effective combination immunotherapy rests on three different pillars that target different facets of the immune response. The first is radiation, um, and we found that the, f the alternatively fractionated radiation, where you deliver a lot of radiation in a couple doses, seems to be more effective. Um, followed by modulation of the tumor microenvironment, which makes the microenvironment receptive to the treatment, and then checkpoint inhibition that I think takes that immune response and extends it. You know, it prevents your T cells from becoming exhausted and leads to long-term durable uh, responses in the mice. And when you combine all three of these together, uh, but not any of them separately, um, you can cure large established tumors in this, uh, what I think is a clinically relevant HPV-related uh, cancer model. And this is sort of how we think it all fits together. Um, you have the radiation killing cancer cells, releasing antigens, um, allowing APCs to pick them up, present them to T cells. Um, this would all grind to a halt in the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, except that we're able to reverse uh, the MDSC and the Treg by our combination of cyclophosphamide and L-nil. This gets the tumor-specific T-cell response going, and we maintain that with uh, checkpoint inhibition. And as with all uh, successful immunotherapies, uh, what we're trying to do is create kind of a virtuous cycle of continuous cross-presentation, immune activation, and eventually we're getting epitope spreading uh, to um, uh, antigens that we didn't target in the first place. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, so the next phase of this work is um, trying to figure out how we can move it into the clinic for reasons I won't go into here. Um, it's very hard to take the parent compound L-nil uh, that we use as an INOS inhibitor and move it into uh, the clinic because of patent-related issues. So we're working with our colleague uh, Ananth Anapragada and his lab on a, um, a grant that's funded by, uh, jointly by the NIDCR and the NIH to create nanoparticles that will inhibit INOS, uh, potentially deliver other um, aspects of our immune modulatory regimen, and create a platform that we can then hopefully ultimately move into clinical trials. Um, so in summary, um, you may not treat or you may not be particularly interested in HPV-related oropharynx cancer, but it is a very good model system for thinking about how to develop combination immunotherapy since it's responsive to checkpoint inhibitors, but only in a minority of patients, just like most solid tumors. Um, targeting the tumor immune microenvironment can increase the efficacy of both immunotherapy but also immune-active um, 
uh, conventional therapies such as chemoradiotherapy, and we're able to show that a combination therapy approach that sort of meticulously identifies and targets different aspects of the immune response uh, can cure large established murine tumors and induce durable immunologic memory. But it's only the combination. If we take any piece of that combination out, it doesn't work. Um, so with that, I'll acknowledge uh, the people who did the work and a lot of the thinking. Jared and Orly, I already mentioned. Rosemary Krupar was a postdoctoral fellow who got the um, uh, chemo radiation model up and running in my lab before she went back to Germany. Um, and my collaborators, um, John Lee, Yvonne Sanger, and Ananth. Um, this is what my lab looks like on a good day. You should see what it looks like on a bad day. Um, <laughs> And of course, we always uh, thank people who pay the bills. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention and the uh, opportunity to come here and have such great scientific conversations with people. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Right, so, so you're bringing up the point that glucocorticoids are immunosuppressive. A lot of patients, because of swelling or inflammation, get glucocorticoids during cancer therapy. What's the effect on the immune system? It's, it's understudied. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't think we know as much as we should about that. Um, definitely long-term steroid, uh, glucocorticoid steroid use is immunosuppressive. Um, but it seems that short-term use, and often these patients do get pretty short courses of steroids, short-term use tends not not to be super immunosuppressive, but it's something that I don't think has been studied in great detail in clinical trials that I'm aware of and something that would be interesting to put into a mouse model. Actually, actually I don't think I can think of a study that's done that. So it's a great point. Right. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point. So we actually have not, in our model, looked at um, cytokines, uh, you know, circulating cytokines or t tumor-expressed cytokines, but I would predict that what you're saying would be the case. And other, others who do study um, fractionation of radiation as, like, you know, a primary research topic have certainly shown that how you fractionate identical uh, biologically equivalent doses of radiotherapy makes a huge difference to, like, every aspect of the immune microenvironment, including uh, the cytokine release. So I'm sure if we looked, we would see something there. Yes, that's a good question. So, I, uh, you know, nitric oxide synthases come, you know, as a big family, and no chemical inhibitor, you know, no small molecule inhibitor is typically fully selective. One of the reasons we use L-nil is that it's, it's among the most selective of the inhibitors, but you're still talking about, like, a 20-fold relative increase in selectivity. It's not, like, a thousand-fold or, you know. Uh, infinitely selective. So, um, and that may be okay because cancer cells actually also express, you know, NNOS, they express ENOS, those have also been implicated, uh, but it's relatively more selective. And I'll be honest, the reason we use it is that we tested a whole slew of them head to head, and that's the one that was empirically the one that worked the best in our model. Yes. Yeah. 
It's a good question, and it's it's a particularly good question because it's paradoxical. So. Um, uh, it, 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 we, 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 we actually looked at this because we had the same question you did and working with my colleague Wabao Zong in uh, Mount Sinai, uh, to our surprise, we, we saw that when you block INOS, you actually polarize macrophages in the direction of M1. You actually create more M1 uh, macrophages. Um, that doesn't answer your question about function because those M1 macrophages have lost one of their cytolytic uh, capacities. But, but in terms of overall population, you're actually driving towards the more immune active phenotype. So yeah, we, we looked at that and we're surprised by what we found. Other questions, suggestions, ideas, things we should look at? Okay, so like, you know, so like class one, class two. Um, so, so we have looked, our tumors do express both, um, you know, they, or sorry, our tumors express uh, class one. We actually haven't looked at class two, although after the conversation I had earlier today, I'm thinking maybe we should look. We haven't looked at that. Um, but the tumors, you know, that we use in our model do express class one, but they don't express a lot of it. It's, it's relatively low. And in general, in solid tumors, um, that is one of the mechanisms of immune escape, you know, relatively low class one expression. Um, in head and neck cancer, um, probably that has been studied in more detail than I can muster at this point. But I know it is a mechanism of immune escape, but for the most part, um, you know, there's enough class one to be responsive to immunotherapy, at least, you know, initially. Uh, but certainly in our tumor models, we've looked, and there's low but detectable class one. Yeah, so, so it's sort of the age-old question of do you use the easy flank model or do you use the technically challenging and painful uh, for the mouse uh, orthotopic model, right? <laughs> and so, so actually, so um, because my project is focused on radiation, I don't, I don't have a facility that will let me radiate orthotopic tumors. I'm restricted to flank tumors, so that's what I use. However, my colleague Simon Young um, uh, you know, he works in the same model, and we collaborate all the time, and he does nothing but orthotopics, and we have seen some really interesting differences. So he injects this exact same tumor line in the buccal space, so he injects it orthotopically in the head and neck mucosa, and this tumor that in the flank is totally unresponsive to checkpoint inhibitors becomes much more responsive and presumably much more inflamed, um, although I'm trying to remember if he's shown me that data or not. In, in the buccal space. So, so it, it makes a huge difference. So for what I'm studying, I'm okay with it being not responsive because the whole point of what I'm doing is trying to make it responsive. So for me, you know, I, I got lucky. You know, I got, I got the right tumor model for what I want to study. But um, if I were studying other things, you know, I might actually, you know, if I weren't using radiation, I would probably be working orthotopically uh, because it's a completely different, um, you know, response. So yeah, it makes a huge difference. So envious. Hmm. 
do I, do I get a discount on the irradiator since I came and gave a talk? Because I'm very envious. I may have to, yeah. I'm, I'm extremely envious. Well, great. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate your attention.